Welcome to Short Cover Look, where we squeeze the bigger picture of literature. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we're here for part three of a four-part series as we journey along Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah, I was so excited about this. I wore my uh, Vonnegut So It Goes shirt. You pull it up a little bit. Okay, yeah, well, I, I'm sorry, I'm in a sitting position and I don't want to <laughs> screw up the microphone because we finally fixed the audio. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, no, we didn't. We never fixed the audio. The audio had no reason to go defunct last time. I have no idea what's going on. Our audio is just always all over the place. Anyway, part three, Cat's Cradle. Yes. What is it, chapter 101 to the end? Yeah, I believe so. And what an ending it was. Climactic, suspenseful, dramatic. Yep. 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 Yeah, well, we'll get there. You want to break this down a little bit here? Yeah. Don't mind if I do? Uh, chapter 101 towards the end. Uh, Papa kills himself with Ice Nine, and during a freak accident, his body is plopped into the ocean. Uh, it freezes all the water on Earth. Everyone in San Lorenzo dies. Mona, for some reason, kills herself. And our narrator writes this, his fucking memoir, because it's a Vonnegut book, uh, and finally gets to meet the uh, Bokonon in the end. And he's blessed with the wisdom that people are fucking stupid. Yeah. Which yeah. seems to be the crux of the Kurt Vonnegut canon. I think so. I think so. Uh, the crux of the Kurt Vonnegut canon, one, people are stupid. Two, war is bad. Three, I'm really good at writing books that are kind of like memoirs. Four, if science sucks, so does religion. If religion sucks, so does science. If science and religion suck, so does everything else. Fair, fair. And I feel like such a hypocrite. Like, I, I wanted to talk about this a little bit. Every book that we read, I'm like, oh, it was, it was okay. Things were going well. And it just fizzled in the end, man. It just didn't do anything for me. This book is literally the definition of a fizzling end. We're just like in the last few chapters, every, excuse me, everything just kind of culminates and then it's just over and people are stupid. That's the answer. Yeah. God damn it. I loved it. <laughs> I fucking loved it. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, um, it's the only way this book could have ended. I, I, would you, would you mm. concede that? I think you're right. And, uh, a lot of what I'd like to get into next week with the review, I actually, for some reason was focusing a lot on Vonnegut and the writing itself. No, I do think it is necessary. Uh, and I think it works. It works well. And in a book which, my God, man, I have been so confused through the entirety of this book, that ending where it's just like, well, you know what? People are stupid. I'm like, well, yes, I am. Thank you, Vonnegut. Yeah. Thank you. I feel good about this. Well, uh, and, and, and somewhere along those lines, could I share an extended quote sure. from this? On 253 through 255... We are gathered here, friends, he said. Uh, this is Minton speaking. We are gathered here, friends, he said, to honor Lo Hunyera Moraturs Tut Zamu Kratz Ya. Children dead. All dead. All murdered in war. It is customary on days like this to call such lost children men. I am unable to call them men for, the simple re for this simple reason. That in the same war in which Lo Hunyera Moratuns Tut Zamu Kratia died. My own son died. My soul insists that I mourn not a man but a child. I do not say that children at war do not die like men, if they have to die. Their everlasting honor and our everlasting shame, they do die like men, thus making impossible the mainly, thus making possible the mainly jubilation of patriotic holidays. But they are murdered children all the same. And I propose to you that if we are to pay our sincere respects to the hundred children, to the hundreds, to the hundred lost children of San Lorenzo, that we may best spend the day despising what killed them, which is to say the stupidity and viciousness of all mankind. Perhaps when we remember wars, we should take off all our clothes and paint ourselves blue and go on all fours all day long and grunt like pigs. That would surely be more appropriate than that would surely be more appropriate than noble oratory shows of flags and well-oiled guns. I do not mean to be ungrateful for the fine martial show we are about to see, and a thrilling show it will really be. He looked at each of us in the eye, and then he commented very softly, throwing it away. He looked at each of us in the eye. Oh yeah, it's a weird little paragraph there. And hooray! say I, for, thr for thrilling shows. We had to strain our ears to hear what Minton said next. But if today really is honor of, but if today is really in honor of 
hundred children murdered in war, he said. Is today a day for a thrilling show? The answer is yes, on one condition, that we, the celebrants, are working consciously and tirelessly to reduce the stupidity and viciousness of ourselves and of all mankind. Make no mistake, this is not Minton speaking. This is Kurt Vonnegut. Okay. Uh, and Vonnegut does have a history of just kind of plugging himself randomly into his books. Uh, no, that seems like a very much Vonnegut uh, speech. Uh, because I think a lot of Vonnegut's books, at least everything I pretty much read, uh, including uh, A Man Without a Country, uh, Vonnegut's got some good views, man. Vonnegut is... At least compelling. Compelling All views. of his views are compelling. Yes. Uh, whether you agree with him or not, I mean, Vonnegut is obviously a man who served in war, uh, and therefore... Was a prisoner of war. Was a prisoner of war, and therefore, I would say, is damn well qualified to speak about war. Uh, compelling, to say the least. Absolutely right. so. Um, could I go from that into my main thrust of this episode? Sure. The Papa character that we've talked about so heavily equating him to Hemingway. How did he go? How did he die in this novel? Went out like Hemingway. Suicide. As soon as our protagonist inherits the world, okay. the world would be writing, everything comes crashing down. There is a famous Vonnegut quote that goes something like, horror is waking up one morning and realizing that your graduating class is running the world. Does that not feel very much like what is going on in that moment, where as soon as Papa dies... You're in charge now, baby. You're in charge, but everything comes crashing down. And why does it do so? How does it do so? In mysterious fashion. True. Comes out of nowhere, as if we had no control in any way. With a bang. With a bang. With a bang. Uh, it, and it is interesting how quick everything culminates as well, because as soon as our character is thrust into this world where now you are in charge, uh, quite literally, before the ceremony's even over, uh, freak accident and the world ends. Uh, so it, it does have a lot to be said as well of, it, it, it's just chance, man. It's just happen chance. You never know yeah. what's going to happen. Uh, and that's very much a Vonnegut kind of style, I think. It's just, we're all kind of just here. And Well, and it goes very deep, I think. Okay. So that first quote I read you, the extended quote. Yes. Was about children being killed at war. Okay. We have this on 271. This coming from our narrator. If I had my daddy beside me as Mona and I walked down the road from the palace, I would have had plenty of questions to ask as I clung to his hand. Daddy, why are all the trees broken? Daddy, why are all the birds dead? Daddy, what makes the sky so thick and wormy? Daddy, what makes the sea so hard and still? Do you remember that passage? Not in particular, not... It comes out of fucking nowhere. Okay. There is, I realized on this read-through of this book of Vonnegut, a clinging to childhood. Okay. Or at least a refusal of responsibility. And this is throughout all short stories, novels, Man Without a Country, watches lectures. There's something weird there. Think of, in Slaughterhouse-Five, Billy, our protagonist, being watched over, and disgracefully so, by his daughter. Okay. He refuses to be the parent there, doesn't he? Um, here, he finds a mother in Hazel after the apocalypse, right? He goes to her, clings to her. Do you remember the subtitle of Slaughterhouse-Five? Uh, nope, not off the top of my head. The Children's Crusade. Remember okay. that? Yes, I do. There's a big deal made of it in the beginning of the book. Yep. Vonnegut is stuck there. All the stuff I've said, all the stuff I've said about Papa being Hemingway and being stuck in childhood, being afraid of owning, writing the way a child fears learning to drive, this, this is culminated on page 278 of this novel. How's the writing going? Hazel asked me. Hazel's mama, remember? Mm -hmm. How's the writing going? Hazel asked me. Fine, mom, just fine. When are you going to show us some of it? When it's ready, mom, when it's ready. A lot of famous writers were Hoosiers. I know. You'll be one of them. You'll be one of a long, long line, she smiled, hopefully. Is it a funny book? I hope so, mom. I like a good laugh. I know you do. Okay. Vaughn gets stuck in childhood because he was a child sent to war. 
Okay. This is why he despises the Papa figures, because Papa went to war and assumed the role of a man, right? Okay. Boy, I am a man. This is what men do. We kill. Vonnegut takes a back seat and says, yeah, you're an idiot, though. Okay. You want to kill, and that's fine, but you're an idiot. Dare you say Vonnegut went to war a, ch war a child and was stuck in time at that? Yeah. Interesting. That's yeah. A, it's a good look on this. A lot of what I wanted to talk about uh, today, as opposed to next week with the review, uh, dealt with uh, the idea of war uh, and it being sent off to war. And I think it's a good analogy to make there that uh, children are sent off to war. And oftentimes it's, you know, considered you're sent off to war and that's where you become a man. Yeah. You become home a man. Uh, but no, I think you've got a damn good point there. Uh, Vonnegut is stuck at this point and uh, he, he doesn't know what to do. And I think that's very much about Vonnegut's writing style. We compared a lot of Hemingway and Vonnegut recently, uh, where Hemingway was the gung-ho war love hero. Uh, and Vonnegut's kind of taken a backseat just being like, I, I don't know how to deal with what we went through here, and it, this is what I'm doing. Uh, not anti-war exactly, but you know, a definitely a, a different look into war. I would be, how do you see this, how do you see Vonnegut not being anti-war? I, 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 maybe I'm just trying to be polite with that. Uh, I think Vonnegut is as anti-war a voice as we've possibly ever had. And our entire theme throughout this book of, you know, people are fucking stupid, it all culminates with the idea of a device that was made, and the device is going to be used for basically war, and a yeah, analogy towards nuclear weapons, perhaps, things like that. Uh, and eventually, we're just all going to kill ourselves, because we don't know what to do with them. Yeah. We're stupid, we're greedy... And we're going to kill ourselves. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it does read very anti-war. Uh, I, I think that's a damn good point that you bring in. Well, and so Ice Nine is an obvious reference to the atomic bomb, mm -hmm. right? Um, the difference being the atomic bomb brought fire, Ice Nine brings ice. What war was it that we saw the installation of the atomic bomb? Is that uh, World War One, World War Two? World War Two. In what war was Vonnegut a prisoner of war? World War II. Yeah. So you have this strange disconnect from the Vonnegut point of view. Vonnegut was a prisoner of war of the Nazis. There might not be a scarier place to be, right? I, True. I mean, and that even does come into play a little bit here. We get the uh, the former Nazi doctor, uh, who is uh, the second victim of ISIS. I can't remember his name, Vaughn something. Right. Who was a pretty good uh, guy, except for the fact that he was a... Yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Wait, he wait, was wait, a former is, SS. I'm not saying that. It's said in the text. Yes. Other than this, he was a pretty nice guy. Um, so, like I say, being, being prisoner of the Nazis might be the scariest place to be in history. True. Not just a prisoner of war, but a prisoner in general of the Nazis might be the scariest place in history to be. So, when the guys on your side come up with this horrifying weapon, is it a relief? I think Vonnegut would argue no. I mean, you may kill them, but you're going to take us all down with them. That's not a solution. That's a problem. But it's a, it's a weird place to be, isn't it? It is. It is. You, you don't want to be a prisoner of war of the Nazis, right? <laughs> no, you don't. I, and I you think, don't want anyone to be a prisoner of the Nazis. No, and this is a solution to that problem. Yeah, because there's always going to... So, this is... If we could get into modern day politics, taking away people's guns, you're only going to take guns away from the good people. Okay. Right? Taking away the atomic bomb you're only going to get atomic weaponry from people who are willing to give it up. Okay. So this is why, this is the same thing on a house-to-house -house basis as on a country basis. What's the only thing that's going to stop a bad guy with a gun? Good guy with a gun. Good guy with a gun. Um, what is the only thing, as we just lose half of our viewership, I'm sure, but what is the only thing that's going to stop a bad nation with a powerful weapon? Good nation with a powerful weapon. And there will always be bad guys with guns. Okay. There will always be bad guys with guns. Okay. Well, as you're joining us here on a very introspective look into Kurt Vonnegut, uh, I, I do think it's interesting if we look in a little bit more of this. I mean, honestly, Vonnegut was a prisoner of war. Uh, and given that, you would assume there is a lot of pain and resentment he has built up towards uh, his captors. However, I, I think it's commendable the way Vonnegut deals with things. 
Uh, because at no point does Vonnegut just go out and say, you know, hey, fuck these guys, which let's be honest, in that predicament, that'd be me. Uh, Vonnegut's a thoughtful man, and he, he plays on things, he puts his humor into it, and he makes it enjoyable. But he's definitely commenting on some big stuff here that I think could be very well lost if you're just reading through this as a science fiction text, which, God forbid, if you ever call that, that's him. Uh, I, I think you're going to lose it. But no, it, absolutely right. Uh, there's a lot going on here with Vonnegut. There's a lot going on with the idea of war. Uh, and I, I do love your idea of a, a child being lost in war. Well, and so I think one of the things that adds to that, um, being a prisoner of war is like being a child when your parents are fighting. You're powerless. True. And you know big scary people are mad at each other, right? So to go back to this analogy of the Cold War, everyone was just a child. Because mom and dad might get mad and get divorced. They'll drop the bomb and the world will never be the same. They'll be split, right? So... It's, a very, it's also a very powerless feeling to go back to that first analogy. The only thing that's going to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Because the powerlessness of that is that a bad guy with a gun gets to make the first decision. So we're always powerless. Okay. We're always stuck in childhood. And when you, when you take that power up scales of magnitude towards atomic weaponry... What good does it ever do to assume adulthood? Okay. Because the very next time you close your eyes, you might not open them. And I think the idea of being powerless, if I may, is a terrifying thing. It's something that people uh, either avoid completely or adamantly are defensive against, the idea of being powerless. Uh, in, in this, not only would we consider Vonnegut was a powerless person as a prisoner of war, uh, seeing the world basically destroying itself around him and nothing he could do about it, I think our narrator is a powerless character as well throughout this. Uh, because here's a man who's basically just got thrust into this situation. I want to write a book. Uh, he's like, well, I want to write a book. Uh, and comes to find out he ends up leading a nation. And the minute he gets any semblance of, I might be getting a little power here. Maybe I can do something. No, you don't have anything. Because the world just fucking ended. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that idea of powerless is uh, thematic throughout this. I think that is a good thing to look into as well. Uh, what I would like to look into a little bit more as well, I, I think there are some religious overtones with this as well. we got a lot going on with religion here, obviously, with the Bakonin. <laughs> you don't say. You don't say. A book about religion <laughs> with religion. Uh, however, I do think it's very interesting that uh, the idea of how the world ends is not in a flood, but the opposite. Yeah. Uh, it is quite literally the anti-flood. Ice uh, destroys the world here. And there's a lot going on, I think, as well about uh, what makes uh, a, a good person, maybe for lack of a better word, uh, what makes a, a good, truthful, honest person, because we have the idea of the uh, Bakonan who is just basically wandering about as considered the outlaw because he wanted to outlaw himself. Uh, there's a lot going on with trust and, I'm trying to think of the word I want to use here, uh, faith, maybe. Well, what is faith? Faith is the ultimate powerlessness. Okay. Uh, what does Bokonon do other than embrace powerlessness true he doesn't he, he embraces powerlessness so much he refuses to even have an opinion true he just wants to write shit down very fair i i think first and foremost i may have found my calling in life and <laughs> <laughs> i apologize i was actually going to save this for next week in our review portion of this but i think since we're on such a roll here if i can find the fucking quote that i wanted that's too far back from 245 and i remember the 14th book of Bakonon which I had read in its entirety the night before. The 14th book is entitled, What Can a Thoughtful Man Hope for Mankind on Earth, Given the Experience of the Past Million Years? It doesn't take long to read the 14th book. It consists of one word and a period. This is it. Nothing. It all comes back to the idea of powerlessness. Uh, so I, I think we've narrowed that down 100%. That's what Vonnegut's getting at here. Uh, and I, I think we've completely gone away from the part three of this, and we're just delving into some review on this here, but that's fine. Uh, it, it is interesting. Uh, and when you know a little bit about Vonnegut, and you know a little bit about the other books he's written, it, it becomes more and more apparent. Uh, I, I think the writing style stands true to Slaughterhouse-Five, the idea of that sly memoir just kind of throwing in here, the idea of powerlessness, the idea of war being bad. Uh, there's a lot of themes throughout Vonnegut that seem to be at play in this 
and his other texts. Along those lines, you mention writing. Yes. Hemingway is seen as a very masculine writer. Why is Hemingway seen as a very masculine writer? Uh, Because Hemingway embodies the idea of a man's man. Got to do what you got to do. Why is his writing seen as masculine? Uh, It's to the point. There's not a lot of floral language and adjective. It's very crisp. It's very concise. Hemingway Uh, gives you the facts. True. Period. Period. Right? Is that what we get from Vonnegut? Absolutely not. We get diarrhea of the mouth from Vonnegut at times. Yes. Go ahead. I think that's where a lot of my problems come with this book. And, like, it, it's a pain in the ass because I like it. Because that rambling Vonnegut is the Vonnegut I like. But he sometimes just goes so far you lose yourself. Yeah. And you're trying to figure out, what the hell were we just talking about? Let's trace back. Anyway, go on. So the idea of masculine writing, as it is so often portrayed is that you get what you need and nothing else. We don't play around us manly men. Vonnegut sure does. Very true. What about Bokanon? Okay. I think Bokanon's... That's an interesting question. To the point, but not. Yeah. Uh, Concise, but ambiguous. Damn it, Bokanon. Yeah. What are you getting at with this here? Just that it's a strange... So, in, in the way... So, if we were to see the world ending in fire as a masculine ending... Okay. That would be the Hemingway prose. The world ending in flood as diarrhea of the mouth... That would be the Vonnegut prose. The world ending somewhere in the middle. Okay. Ice Nine. Is that the Bokanon? So is this a Bokononian apocalypse? A Bokonian, a Bokononian apocalypse. I'm never going to be able to say that right. It's Bokonian. Uh, it's Bokononian. I know it is. Uh, okay, I can give you that. It, maybe that is... Because, well, when you think about the flood, which was the first way the world ended. True. The opposite of that The is biblical way. Fire. Fire. You think. Yes. But on another opposite of that is ice, like okay. you mentioned earlier. I, it seems to me maybe that's just... Maybe that's where Vonnegut finds his peace. Because I think a lot of uh, what Vonnegut talks about here, uh, the Bakonon, I, I, I would like to imagine that's very Vonnegut himself. Uh, we keep trying to you know, plug Vonnegut into the text here. I think you can see a lot of Vonnegut in the Bakonon. Uh, just kind of drifting through, being like, well, it is what it is. Don't know what to do. So it goes. Yeah. Uh, they, Which there is a so it goes in here. Did you catch that? Yes, it did. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I, I think maybe that is the Vonnegut way of things. Uh, maybe it is just, uh, we are powerless. It's a very hipster uh, spirituality kind of thing here. Almost that blend of Eastern philosophy and just whatever that guy was talking about at the bar last week. Uh, it's that idea of uh, being powerless and just kind of being along for the ride. And, you know, take the good with the bad, the bad with the good. And, well, at least you're an okay person. Maybe do your weird shot side, put your feet together. That's cool. Makes you feel better. You're closer as a human. Uh it just seems very Vonnegut to me. It really does. This reads like a Vonnegut text. Yeah. I'm just all over the place right now. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse my Vonnegut. Speaking of diarrhea of the mouth. Excuse my Vonnegut. Uh, anything else you want to touch on here? I feel like we've uh, drifted way into a uh, more review of this as opposed to just uh, reaction. Uh, I honestly didn't mind the ending. I, I thought it was appropriate. Uh, I was confused as hell throughout most of this text. But honestly, I wrote this down after working like an eight-hour shift in customer service where like you're just getting your mind muddled and having a shitty week to have Vonnegut walk in and just be like, yeah, well, we're all going to die anyway. It's nice. World ends in ice. Get over it. It's nice. I like it. Yeah, it's different. It, 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 but like I said earlier, I think it's the only way this novel could have ended. I'm inclined to agree with you. It had, uh, to, end in, it had to end in a bang, right? The rest of it was such a slow slide. It was a bang, but it was such a subtle bang. Uh, it was just, well, it's over. Uh, and, and then the appearance of the Bokonon at the end, where he's just like, well, you know, it is what it is. Uh, and it's the idea that, you know, perhaps maybe even the author at the end uh, may have followed the Bokonon's advice, you know. Go out there and freeze yourself. Yeah. What are you going to do? Well, we've... <sighs> that is troubling. Think so? Eh, not, maybe not troubling. Maybe troubling is not the correct word, but... We do have this manuscript. It was written down. How does the author end? It's kind of left up to us. Because it has to be. Yeah. Because you don't write your own death scene. 
Right. Point. Point. So, uh, hmm. how well are we served with a first-person narrator here? I feel like next week we're just going to be sitting around and be like, Vonnegut, man. We talked about everything. Vonnegut. <laughs> Slow nod, awkward pause. <laughs> Vonnegut. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I got for this week. Anything else you want to touch on real quick? I, I suppose not. That's Okay. Vonnegut. Um, Vonnegut. All right. We're nearing the end here. I don't know what else to talk about. Like, I don't want to dive any further. I've used a lot of what I plan to use next week. Yeah, it's not like I asked you a question at the end there. It's not like you just ignored a question, but that's fine. Uh, we will we will conclude things next week with a review for Cash Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, if you hit the like button, it really helps us out here on the channel, so we request that you do so. Even if you dislike the video, you nasty son of a bitch. Also, if you are into this sort of thing, make sure you are subscribed to this channel. Um, and if you would like to help us create more content here on Strip Coverlet, there's a link to our Patreon as always to be found in the description below. Vonnegut. Oh. My life sucks. Well, join the crowd.